Our gospel reading today comes from Mark 6, 1 through 13, about the people of Nazareth turn against Jesus. Jesus left and returned to his hometown with his disciples. The next Sabbath, he taught in the Jewish meeting place. Many of the people who heard him were amazed and asked, how can he do all this? Where did he get such wisdom and the power to work these miracles? Isn't he the carpenter, the son of Mary? Aren't James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon his brothers? Don't his sisters still live here in our town? The people were very unhappy because of what he was doing. But Jesus said, prophets are honored by everyone except the people of their hometown and their relatives and their own family. Jesus could not work any miracles there except to heal a few sick people by placing his hands on them. He was surprised that the people did not have any faith. Jesus taught in all of the neighboring villages. Then he called together his 12 apostles and sent them out two by two with power over evil spirits. He told them, you may take along a walking stick, but don't carry food or traveling bag or any money. It's all right to wear sandals, but don't take along a change of clothes. When you are welcomed into a home, stay there until you leave that town. If any place won't welcome you or listen to your message, leave and shake the dust from your feet as a warning to them. The apostles left and started telling everyone to turn to God. They forced out many demons and healed a lot of sick people by putting olive oil on them. May God add his blessings to these words. Well, here we are with our American tradition of the July 4th, observing the independence of our nation, a nation that resulted from conflict, a nation of people fleeing conflict in their home country, conflict and choosing to establish a new way of life. Well, we're fresh out of continents to explore, <laughs> fresh out of new territories to settle. Um, and here in the church, our churches, our denominations, our Protestant denominations born out of conflict. So as we hear in the readings today between Ezekiel and Jesus and Paul, the Christian church has never been short of conflict. And I'm not, I, I didn't think till this morning, but I should have looked up the time difference between Ezekiel's life and Paul's life, but I'm sure it was a considerable number of years. And so, as Jesus pointed out, prophets were always treated the same. They were welcomed everywhere except for their hometowns where they were known best. And maybe people thought they were just crazy because they'd known them all their lives and then they received the calling to be a prophet and changed into different people. And one of the things that uh, came to me as I was preparing this is people's willingness to embrace a different way of worship than what they're used to. When we reach a comfort level of this is how I worship, and then someone like a prophet like Ezekiel or Jesus comes along and says, Mm, that's a little off. This is the way you should worship. It's just like critiquing us. And so I can see how the prophets were always discounted. Eventually, were their, the people they were ministering to were treated them poorly. We expect the prophets to believe like we believe. But the prophets who answer to God show us a different way. So we see this in Paul's speech. They call it the fool's speech. Where he talks about there are certain super apostles that are manipulating the citizens. 
with their special claims to authority. Now, let me know if this sounds familiar in our present day. Disguising themselves as ministers of righteousness, these super apostles are turning the citizens into their slaves, preying on and taking advantage of them, putting on airs around them, shaming them, and perhaps even abusing them physically. We are experiencing that in the headlines in our nation all the time, in fact, around the world. And we grow, we grow frustrated as citizens because of the individuals that seem so ready to submit to that kind of charismatic, super apostle-like way of doing things. By contrast, Paul, in his writing, describes his, uh, his ministry as transparent disclosure of truth accessible to everyone's conscience before God. That's an important thing to point out. Everyone's conscience before God. He just lays it out to them and then it's up to our conscience to process it. The proclamation that Christ is Lord makes us slaves to one another for Jesus' sake. It cannot be used without enacting a contradiction to deceive, control, or manipulate others. I guess that's one of the things I like about the American Baptist churches, about the independence, about the not getting in the way of people seeking truth in their lives. And I think I may have been guilty of that, of getting in the way of people seeking truth in their lives, thinking that uh, I might have the answer that everybody needs to conform to. And routinely I am humbled, just like Paul was. And this is what Paul's talking about, being humbled and not claiming that he has all the answers. And so we get into what constitutes true spiritual authority. How do we distinguish it from false teachers and prophets? And how should we allow those people to influence us whose authority we can trust? And how do we respond when spiritual abuse is taking place? And so this sets the stage for interpreting what we hear in 2 Corinthians 12, two through 10, and as well as in Mark's reading. They're as relevant to us today as they were in Paul's day. So we hear Paul sharing that uh, that he's not going to boast. He's not going to boast on his own behalf, except of his weakness. As we heard, he says, if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth, but refrain from it so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me. And then he talks about this thorn in the flesh that he asked, three times asked God to remove from him. Well, that thorn in the flesh is that conflict. You know, Paul, prior to being uh, called by Jesus, was a pretty brutal person, had a pretty brutal mission. He did a lot of damage. But then he was talking about messengers of Satan to torment him. And as we heard in Ezekiel's reading, and in Jesus' reading, there are going to be people who are not receptive to the message. And I've read elsewhere that Paul was not a super great public speaker. He was not often compelling. And so I think that was part of his thorn in the flesh. This knowing that he wasn't as charismatic as some of the super apostles that he was writing against, reminding the Corinthians kind of correcting them, showing them the way they should worship. And the thorn in the flesh of all of the counter messages that were going on, the thorn in the flesh of Paul's own past, of people, I'm sure, throwing his past in his face. You sentenced Christians to death. How can you be preaching this now? So I'm sure he dealt with that all the time. And 
Paul addresses what probably were the three, the ways these super apostles sought to establish their authority. One way is that they espoused having a particular religious, ethnic, or even Christian heritage. And then there were those that were based on mastery of adversity, having survived extreme uh, trials or journeys. But one experience that Paul does boast about was being lowered in a basket in order to evade persecution. But he boasts here that uh, it wasn't his prowess over suffering, but the help he received from God through others in his time of weakness. And so in the ancient world, attesting to spiritual journeys was a popular way of claiming divine validation for one's authority. I know I've shared my story to the pulpit, um, and it's easy to fall into this trap, I guess I would call it, of saying, look at my journey, that attests to my authority with God. No, it doesn't. It just sharing my inspiration that I have. And uh, I, along with Paul, have come to recognize that I need to humble myself to resist these voices of trying to be a super apostle or boasting myself more than what I am. And I think the thing that he says best is what, when he tells people about accessing the truth, what can be seen in me or heard from me? You know, we've heard those things about watch what people do, not what they say. Watch how they behave. How do they really act on a daily basis? That tells you who they really are. And so he's acknowledging this when he's writing to the Corinthians and saying, you know, it isn't about his journey. It's about what he's doing now. Making that accessible to others. Letting them process that in their own way. Letting them find inspiration in their own way. That was Paul's journey to be a guide, but not um, a savior. And so when he talks about God saying, my grace is sufficient for you, that's what he comes back and talks about. Whenever you're in conflict, whenever you feel like the, the world is beating you down, like I'm sure he probably did a lot, going back to God and God says, my grace is sufficient for you. So, oops. so then we come to Mark, and Jesus, again, similar to what others have experienced, and this goes, just goes to show that we as people really don't change much. And we hear all these people that have known Jesus all their lives being astounded by what he knows at a relatively young age when wisdom in elders was highly esteemed and questioning where that authority comes from. Where does he get his authority from? And having grown up, you know, as a carpenter's son in a town that was not very highly regarded I'm sure that did not, uh, people were used to being put down, of used to being thought less of, not being as good as people in Jerusalem, not being as holy, not being as wise. But yet here is Jesus speaking with one with authority. And they're like, who is this person? This isn't somebody that normally comes from our town or lives in our town. And I, I, like how it says just kind of offhand, well, he wasn't really able to do anything except heal a few sick people by laying his hands on them. Like that was nothing. Like, uh, yeah, that's a minor miracle. That's a, yeah, that's all he could do. And yet people didn't believe. So he tells his apostles to hit the road. Don't take anything with you except a stick. No change of clothes. So I can imagine in our day, a person was walking out in the desert, the hot desert all day, and you welcome him into their home, the smell couldn't have been great. 
And maybe they got to change their clothes while their other clothes are being washed. I don't know how that worked. Or people just, you know, it was so common that people just weren't sensitive to it like we would be. But that's when they talk about, you know, don't take a change of clothes. I'm thinking, man, that, that, that couldn't have been good. But then when people didn't welcome the message or welcome them to shake the dust off your feet as a warning, it takes me back to that, you know, you were from dust you were created and to dust you shall return. And so we need to stay present with where we are, stay present with God created us, God will sustain us, and God will help us. And when we turn to dust, God will be there. So what constitutes true spiritual authority and power? How do we distinguish true from false claims to authority? Our claim to authority has only one source. God's rescuing us in weakness, in Jesus, through the Spirit. Not only are appeals to that authority always public and accessible to everyone's conscience, but they can only be used without enacting a contradiction for one purpose, building up one another so that we grow together amid all that we experience into the truth of our full maturity as human beings in Christ full maturity as human beings in Christ. That's our path. That's what God is present for in our weakness, to help us grow into full maturity in Christ together. Amen.